Good morning. Okay, so we're going to start by doing a chart for a gentleman. And I've already set up the chart in the computer. And this is the natal chart. Um, then we're going to move on to the transits in a little while. And we're going to talk about what is coming in the future. And we can also ask questions and look and see what happened past, present, and future. This particular program that I use is um, on on any Apple product, it's called Astro Gold, and I really recommend it. Um, it's about thirty or forty dollars. If you want the full program, um, then it is Solar Fire, and it's the best program I have found out there. I don't particularly like any of the free ones, and I don't like some of the other ones. This is the one I learned to read on, so this is the one that I use. However, all the information is the same on all of them. If you want a free chart, you can go to astrolab, L-A-B-E, dot com, or any number of sites that have um, free um, astrology charts. So let me first start off by saying that the archetypes are the planets. Okay, so all of these planets represent the psychological organs that I talk about. And I'm going to refer to each of the planets and their meaning. And I'll give some of the myths and the stories that are aligned with those. Um, once you hear what they mean, then you start having an understanding. So in the podcast for season eight, I'm going to go through all of the myths. And in some of the future lectures, I will also, the videos, I'll also go through some of the myths. Once you learn the myth, once you learn the story, then you automatically understand how that person lives out that story. By house is the scenario, the stage in which they're going to play it out. Are they going to play out that anger or that warrior or that strategist at work in their health, in their body, with their family, with their marriage? And this is pretty easy it's it's kind of like math and i don't like math <laughs> but this is sort of like psychological math so we're going to start with the sun the moon and the ascendant so this particular person is um sun in gemini moon in virgo and ascendant in pluto and what this means is when your sun is in gemini in the eighth house your moon is in Virgo in the 10th house, and your ascendant is on the cusp of the first, is what we're gonna say is starting to make a story, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the three planets. We're gonna take Gemini, which is ruled by Mercury, I mentioned, um, Virgo, which is ruled by Chiron, which I mentioned, and Pluto, which rules Scorpio. And we're gonna get the taste, we're gonna get the archetype for this particular person okay now mercury is the god of the upper world and the underworld the one that keeps zigzagging keeps going up and down doesn't ever stop so this person is going to have a species of communication there's going to be something about maybe it's art maybe it's music but they're going to be a messenger and then you have chiron which is the planet that or the asteroid that rules the moon in virgo and that is going to tell you that the mercury has a wound associated with it so perhaps this person has a speech impediment or perhaps this person has something in their mind that keeps them as carolyn mace would say in wound talk or woundology and then you have Pluto. Pluto. Pluto is regenerative powers. Pluto is the archetype of the death and rebirth. And if Mercury is the god of the upper world and the underworld, the one that's constantly flip-flopping, and you have Pluto, which is who he goes to visit, and he brings Chiron. You see how I'm making like a story to try to like get the three to make sense? And then that's sort of how I start to develop the the archetype of the person this is going to be a person that is continuously going up and down back and forth side to side they're in a constant movement they're sort of moving around their wound in all different areas but basically they are sort of living and making love to and sort of in that psychological orgasmic state with their wound they don't let it go but they have the ability we always have to remember that we have a zero to a hundred we always have to remember that every coin has two sides and if they have pluto as one of their major archetype planets 
and they have an ability to regenerate. And if Chiron is the other planet, then they have a real uh, ability to regenerate their black moon. They have, I mean, their, their Chiron, their wound. So this is a person with very strong power to heal their wounds, especially mentally, if they um, really put their mind to it. But it's really about free will. It's really about level of consciousness. Are they going to choose to have they're sort of, you know, sit in the mud with the pigs, um, you know, and and move around their their junk, or are they going to decide that they're going to heal their, their wounds? So what do we have? We've got the sun, and here's Gemini in the eighth. We're gonna get to the eighth house in a minute. Then we have the moon in Virgo in the tenth house, and we've got the ascendant on the cusp of the first. So we always want to take the sun, the moon, and the ascendant and make a story, find the myth that is linked with those three planets. So that's the first thing you should be doing. Take out your chart, write out your three planets, the three signs, and find the story. This is where knowledge of mythology is so, so helpful because what happens is you get to start seeing what myth you're living. And that's why I always say, what story are you living? What myth are you living? Every single one of us is living out a myth that we think that we must do over and over and over again. And it's a way that we're gonna tackle the chart. It's gonna be the way that we tackle our life. So this person is going to be constantly in the wound, talking about the wound, living in the wound constantly. And it might be an example that professionally, because the moon is in the 10th house of profession, they are actually a talk therapist. Maybe that's the profession that they chose because oftentimes our archetype and our story, our myth, will choose and determine what, um, what profession we're living. This comes primarily from ancestral astrology, but it is also one of the ways that we heal our wound. So for instance, I'll always tell my students and my children, I teach and talk for a living because I was not heard. So it's the way that I can start healing the wound and hear myself and have people listen because I have an underlying wound that basically is that I wasn't heard. So this is, uh, it could be a very much a case for this person. So let's talk about the placement of the house. Once you get the taste of what the archetype is, you want to look at the house, okay? And this particular person is an eighth house son. The eighth house has to do with other people. So there is a chart, and you can Google this. Um, if not, I have um, one that I can share with you. Um, I don't have it with me right now, but um, it's in one of my packets for my coaching program, and if you just reach out, I'll send you um, a link to that chart. But pretty much it's a chart of all of the houses and what the houses mean. You wanna have an idea of what the houses mean because this is gonna be like the next step in your math formula, okay? So first the myth, then you're going to, um, then you're going to look at what house the sun is in, okay? Remember, we're looking at the story of conception then we're looking at pregnancy, then we're looking at um, birth, and then we're looking at zero to seven. Same thing in the chart. You may not necessarily have the information about the birth, although birth will oftentimes be related to the ascendant, but you can ask the client or yourself what your story is. So we're doing that same layering, we're just using the chart, and we have the basic information. So the house that you're born is part of the conception story. The relationship between your sun and your moon is going to tell you about the parent's state of mind, where they were at psychologically, subconsciously at the moment of conception, okay? So later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about aspects. Aspects are when the two planets are talking to one another and they can actually be talking very nice to one another or they could be at odds with one another. If the two planets are not getting along, it is going to create problem in you and it's gonna be an internal dialogue that's negative. If the planets are getting along, like in trines and sextiles, then those two planets are gonna be saying really nice things to one another and those are gonna be things that are integrated very well in your psyche. 
The hard aspects are called squares, opposition, and quincuxes. And there's also some things called conjuncts that can go and vary between being hard aspects or soft aspects. So those will come in a little while. So we look at the house and we look at the relationship between the sun and the moon. In this particular person's case, they are a Gemini and their moon is in Virgo and they're a little far apart, so they're not at odds with one another, but there's a close proximity to almost being in conflict. Gemini and Virgo are two signs that are on the same cross, therefore it's almost a square. That means that their parents were almost in an argument or their parents were almost not getting along. So that's gonna talk about the psyche of the person where they're going to be, hmm, maybe they're about to conceive something and then after they do it an argument breaks out just an example let's say that maybe these people were meeting they met at a club they had a great time and they had you know a wonderful evening and then they woke up and they were both realized what had what had happened they had both been married or they had both been in relationships and a fight breaks out how dare you or you're my friend's lover and what are you doing and you could just imagine you know the drama and this is what you're going to do and you're going to talk with the client you're going to say what happened what do you know about your conception and this is why the dialogue is important with the client however you can still see certain things so this is an almost square an almost conflict and so this could be a person whose psyche is right when they're about to conceive something or after they conceive it they almost screw it up let's say or they almost bash themselves or they almost you know create a problem so that it doesn't work out and that will talk about you know um, the psyche of the person so let's go back to the house the house in the eighth I mean the sun in the eighth house the eighth house has to do with resources that are other people or shared resources, has to do with sex, has to do with taxes, has to do with other people's money, has to be do with the level of certain partnerships like business partners. And it has to do with secrets. The eighth house has to do with death, secrets, taxes, things we hide. So it's not the level of secrecy that we find in the twelfth house, but it's a secrecy at we don't want people to know really what's in there. So this person is going to have a tendency to wear masks or to hide or to put on a face that not necessarily is one that is. So when you realize that one of the archetypal planets is Pluto, which is Scorpio, which rules the eighth house, and now you have a sun in the eighth, you start seeing that there's a very strong tinge of Scorpio. And then you see that there's a Scorpio ascendant. So now you're starting to see that the Pluto archetype is gonna be very, very, very strong. And every archetype has a positive and negative. So the positive part of the Pluto archetype is the ability to regenerate, the ability to just dig deep, go down, down, down into the depths of self and say, I'm rising from the ashes and this new phoenix emerges. However, the negative part is to be Hades, is to be negative, is to stay down there, is to just brood, I'm alone, I'm lonely, I'm sad, this is miserable, this is depression. And you can see how it's the level of consciousness and the person's individual free will that will determine whether or not they are going to... Um, are they going to speak their wound and they're going to like sort of just hang out in the mud or if they're really going to come out and regenerate and do something about it. So once you get the archetype, once you kind of see the relationship between the sun and the moon, which we'll talk, talk to you a little bit about conception, then you look and see what sun house you're talking about because the sun will tell you the additional layer. I want you to think of it as a tattoo. This is a person who is a Gemini. They're a Gemini with a tattoo or a sock covering of Scorpio. So if we know Gemini is one that speaks, one that's hot and cold, one that flips up, flops a lot, then on top of that, you have the depth of Scorpio. This person has to have some sort of conflict inside because Gemini is a very shallow sign. It's a sign that's very superficial, but all of a sudden they're layered with this depth 
And they're layered with something that is extremely deep, which is Scorpio, which is the Pluto. And that has to cause some sort of internal frustration or internal conflict. Because what am I? Am I superficial? Am I shallow? Or am I extremely deep? And then you could see where this can cause a flip-flop. So I want to tell you another thing. I don't want to share this person's personal information with you, but they happen to be... Um, born around um there's a, a lot of sixes in this person's particular uh time um their virgo moon virgo is a six um it's a six sign um they have six in their year and they have six in their time so i started seeing a lot of sixes show up and i wanted to share something with you is that they are 24 degrees of gemini so what happens is one of the things that we could do, and I mentioned this in the podcast in season seven, for those of you who may not know, I have a podcast called Mistress of the Subconscious um, on iTunes. You can see that on my website at www.dryahia.com slash podcast. And season seven just came out yesterday. I'm very excited for that. Um, and I talk about this. What you do is you take your degree of your son so in this case, it's 24 degrees, and you add the number that takes you to 30. And at this person's sixth birthday, when they were six, 24 plus six, 30, they turned into the next sign. So my sons, for instance, were born at zero degrees of Leo. So at 30, they would turn into Virgos. I was born at 23 degrees of Pisces. That means at seven years old, I became an Aries. So there's a theme here with six over and over and over. And six is the sign of the Virgin. Six is the number related to Virgo. Six is the number of the Earth. So there's some message here about death because the number uh, six, even though the number four is the number associated with death, the, the energy of earth is associated with death because it's only on the, the earth plane that this material body dies. In the other planes, there isn't death per se because there's no flesh. So there's something here about death and we see this with the recurrent Scorpio theme again, again, and again. So what happened was when this person turned six years old, they turned from Gemini to Cancer. So for 30 some years, um, they were a Cancer. For 30 years until they were 37, they were a Cancer. That's a big chunk of life for somebody who was born Gemini to be Cancer. And you see the same thing. I'm almost a Gemini, but then I turn into a Cancer. My parents are almost arguing or almost in conflict at conception, but at first it's fine, but then comes the square, then comes the problem. I was almost a Gemini, I turned into a Cancer, meaning I was very superficial, but then I became very deep and emotional. There's a positive polarity with the Earth, with the air sign of Gemini, but then there's a negative or feminine polarity with the water sign of Cancer. So you can see that there's this like almost confusion or work at becoming what I'm truly supposed to become because right when I'm gonna become it, something changes, the stakes change on me. And this is gonna be subconsciously a pattern that we're gonna see. So there's so many different ways to get information from a chart. There is no one right way. I kind of just intuitively feel my way through it and I noticed the recurrent of sixes and I said, let me look further. And I did, and I found this other element. So there's no right or wrong. I'm just kind of breaking it down for you how I do it so you have an idea. Okay, so now we move on to the moon. The moon, remember, is the emotional state of mind that the mother had. It is the emotional body. The moon in Virgo is a moon of adulthood. It's a moon of structure. It's a moon of responsibility. It's a moon of guilt. So this is a person who carries guilt. This is a person who perhaps emotionally got no nurturance unless he or she was physically ill. So it's moons that grow up very fast. And it makes sense that if somebody was born a Gemini, which is like the eternal child, and all of a sudden at six years old, they have to become a cancer, kind of maternal, that they were forced to grow up or they were forced to have a, a, a sub substantives change pretty early on in their life. Another thing that would indicate that would be the fourth house. 
everything in astrology is about finding patterns, finding something that recurs over and over and over again. So if I see a moon in Virgo, this is someone who had to grow up, grow up fast, and I see a Saturn in the fourth, there has to be some sort of death, there has to be some sort of rule, there has to be some sort of structure, maybe perhaps grandparents were put to live with this person, maybe there was a move, maybe there was a death in the family, one of the parents, the fourth house is the house of the parents, um, Saturn is the planet of death, and the reason I went to look at the fourth house is because the fourth house has to do with, um, the fourth house has to do with birth, to death. It's the life cycle. I just want to make sure you guys can see that. Um, so the fourth house is the one that will tell you the span of the whole life. So this is person who has Saturn in Pisces. Saturn rules death and structure and problems and all the beauty of Saturn. It's at five degrees of Pisces. This person has Aquarius and then at five degrees of Pisces they got their Saturn. So this was a little bit later in their childhood. There had to be some sort of structure, some sort of rapid change, some sort of death, some sort of really um, marked thing in their psyche. Wherever Saturn is, is something very, very marked. Saturn in the fourth is a tough placement because if it's your childhood and you have Saturn in there, there had to be something that sort of stripped you of your childhood. And if we think of this person being Gemini and all of a sudden they had to turn into Cancer, maybe the nurturer or the child that was eternal turned in the child that didn't get their needs met, or they wanted to be loved and they wanted to have nurturance but their parents passed or something like that then you could start seeing why they are hiding out in the eighth house i don't want you to really see me i don't want you to really know what my truth is i'm going to wear a mask and i'm still the eternal child but um but you're going to at the root still be that eternal child you just haven't had your needs met so the moon in Virgo, I spend quite a bit of time with clients on the moon because I said it's the emotional language, it's the emotional body, and it's going to explain how this person wants love. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the person is going to create an illness because they want to get love, but it might be that when they're sick or when they do have an illness or even a cold, it's the only time they think, they think that they're allowed to take some downtime, that they're allowed to stop working, that they're allowed to ask for someone to take care of them. So it's a very heavy moon, the moon in Virgo. Think of the moon in Virgo as that child that had to grow up really quickly, take care of the, the younger siblings, and never had any time to be a child. And sometimes illness and the function of illness subconsciously is to have some dime downtime and allow myself to be a child or allow myself to, to have some some time alone or some time for others to care for me rather to me to be the one that cares for them and just to go back to the importance of the degree in which you're born if this person at six years old became a cancer and they had to become a nurturer then their childhood could have been stripped from them at a very young age and what happens is that maybe illness is the only time that they're allowed to have anybody else take care of them so um the moon in Virgo will definitely, you know, sort of support support that. Um, the moon in Virgo also, it rules intestines. The moon is emotions and Virgo has to do with the body part of the intestines or the stomach. So this is somebody who can swallow their emotions, you know, keep them bottled up, or this is somebody who could, um, you know, easily get um, IBS or GI discomfort, Crohn's disease, any number of issues in their GI, um, GI system, excuse me, because the emotions don't have an outlet. And then the next thing is the ascendant, the ascendant in Scorpio. So you need to do a little bit of math here, okay? And it's not really math, it's just a little hop, skip, and a jump. What you wanna do is you wanna find the ascendant. First, let me tell you what the ascendant is. The ascendant is what the person is pretending or showing the world to be. It's a mask that they wear. But it's interesting because in quantum, psychology, in quantum astrology, it says it's what you need to become. 
And so even though, for instance, I put on the Sagittarius mask because I'm a Sagittarius ascendant and I teach and I'm all about philosophy and psychology and, you know, being at the university, it's something that I still need to integrate because I don't necessarily believe that I am that person. So even though I have an, a lot of idealistic tendencies and I love to be at the university system, there's a big part of Sagittarius it's about enjoying life it's a big part about just being sort of loose and fancy free and I have difficulty with that so that's the part that I need to integrate so this person is going to have a little bit of an easier time integrating their Scorpio ascendant because they're already an eighth house sun and they already have Pluto as one of their um, major planets in terms of in terms of the the sun moon and the ascendant um, so they're going to have that sort of scorpionic tinge to them. However, they still need to incorporate. And perhaps if they are playing the woundology game, it might be that they need to incorporate the positive of Scorpio, which is that they have some control in their life and that they can regenerate easily based on the fact that they have so much Scorpio in their chart. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to find not only the sign, but you want to find what planet rules the ascendant. And in this case, it's Pluto and it's in the 10th. So there's going to be a direct relationship between the ascendant and the planet that rules the ascendant. In my case, I have Jupiter in the second and Sagittarius. So the first house and the second house are going to have a connection. And that's going to give you another taste of where the person is going to display that ascendant quality or where they need to incorporate that ascendant quality. And the 10th house is the house of the mother. The 10th house is the house of the profession. So this is person who very, very simply can be a healer who has, like I said before, the ability to do talk therapy or doing analysis or uh, psychoanalysis or something you know deep in terms of psychic work or psyche work okay so you, you find a relationship between the house of the ascendant the planet and the planet and the house where the planet of the ascendant lies and you do this over and over this is one of the major things in astrology astrology is not about venus in the eighth Uranus in the 10th. That's cookie cutter astrology, mundane astrology. That is not what you want to do. You're trying to find a relationship. You're trying to find patterns, things that you see over and over and over again. And so you would take the Gemini, the Gemini moon, the sun in the 8th, and you would look for Mercury. And there's Mercury is in the 8th. So you know now that the eighth is a very important sign for the sun and the moon and for the sun and mercury and you would do the same for the moon the moon is in the tenth in virgo and it's related to the fifth house chiron so there has to be a relationship between the ten and the fifth house the tenth house is the mother the fifth house is children the tenth house is profession the fifth house has to do with creative endeavors or real estate or entrepreneurship so there can be something there about being your own boss being your own healer um, it could have to do with wounded children, either the client themselves or um, their own children that they have later on. So we're putting things in perspective. We're putting things in relationship. Everything in astrology, everything in life is about relationship. It's the fourth main need, love, connection, relationship. Without relationship between two things, it really doesn't make much sense. So don't botch the chart by cookie cutter. You know, maybe that's the way to learn initially, but you want to start seeing the relationships. So now the next level of the chart and the next level of relationship are the aspects. The aspects I mentioned are how you connect two planets. They're either going to speak very nicely to one another, and those are called soft aspects, and those are conjunctions sometimes, because some conjunctions are hard. Those are gonna be sextiles, and those are gonna be trines. We're not gonna talk about those today. Those are what I call the things in a client's toolbox that they already have that's good. They already have positive. They already know how to utilize those tools. I don't spend too much time on those. It's just not my way of doing astrology. However, please take a look at your aspects and any one of these free charts will tell you what you have trying, what you have sextile, and what you have conjunct. I like to spend my time on the hard aspects because those are the things that are causing trouble to a person. So the hard aspects are squares, 
oppositions, and sometimes conjunct. What makes a conjunction difficult or hard? Depends on the two planets. So for instance, the Sun and Venus, this is a soft aspect. These are two very pleasant planets. They cause no problems. This is going to be somebody who's either very attractive, who's very sexual, who has a sex appeal, who has a charisma. Not a problem. It causes no problem. However, here you have a hard aspect, which is the Pluto conjunct the Moon and Pluto conjunct Uranus. So conjunct is when two planets are next to each other. They're sort of like sisters or twins. And they're very close together in proximity. And they're either going to cause a problem in the psyche because it's like having another layer of a tattoo. If it's a positive layer like Venus, Venus in the eighth is beautiful. That's a wonderful sexual place.